Greetings. I'm John Pomfret, uh, former Washington Post correspondent and author of a book uh, on the relationship between the United States and China called The Beautiful Country in the Middle Kingdom. I'm here with Willie Wolap Lam and Richard McGregor. Uh, I'll introduce them in a second. And we're going to be discussing the political future of Xi Jinping, the uh, General Secretary of the Communist Party of China, as China walks into yet another uh, political transition, the 19th Party Congress, which is upcoming, to, well, scheduled to start on October 18th. Um, and with me, Willie Wolap Lam is a longtime China watcher. In fact, he's written a book about every Communist Party leader since Deng Xiaoping. So Deng Xiaoping, Jiang, uh, Zhao Ziyang, Jiang Zemin, Hu Jintao, and Xi Jinping. Uh, he, for many, many years, he was the South China Morning Post's leading correspondent on China. Now he works for a variety of uh, think tanks and foundations looking at Chinese politics. It's been his passion for his whole life. And he's been, for many of us in the China field, someone we always look, look to for, for guidance and advice on, on the course of Chinese politics. And to his left is Richard McGregor, a uh, longtime correspondent for the Financial Times, who has been based uh, both in Beijing and in Japan, Tokyo, and also in the United States. He has, and, and, and as, as is as often the case, as a foreigner and as an Australian, his perspective on all three countries is extraordinarily valuable for us who often get caught in the weeds. Richard's the author of two books. One is called The Party, which is a history, well, uh, basically a reminder to all of us who thought that China's government was more important about how the party, the Chinese Communist Party, really does control the country. Uh, his second book is Asia's Reckoning, which is an investigation into the tortured relations between the United States, Japan, and China, and, and what that portends for the future of Asia itself. So I'm really lucky to be here with these, these two gentlemen to dis discuss the Xi Jinping issue in China. Um, and I want to start off with a question for Willie. Um, uh, Willie's... Um, not his most recent book, but in one of his books on the uh, Chinese politics in the year of Xi Jinping, Willie, Willie's subtitle is basically is a question, and he asks basically, is it renaissance reform or retrogression? And I'm curious, as we see the rise of Xi Jinping, somebody who's been compared to Chairman Mao, which, which one is it? Uh, and, and where do you fall on this issue? Well, thank you, John. And it's very nice to... Uh, have a session with uh, two of my most admired uh, China watchers and teachers. Well, so let me just begin with uh, Xi Jinping and with the possible trajectory of his policies, whether it's reform, um, um, uh, retrogression, or uh, just um, sustenance of uh, party policy going forward. Um, well, just next month, we're having this um, twice in a decade major uh, event on the Chinese political calendar, the 19th Party Congress. And um, uh, people have, have been asking me the potential lineup of the Politburo and the Politburo Standing Committee. As you know, uh, China is not a um, Western-defined uh, democratic country. So all powers um, is located at the seven-member Politburo Standing Committee. So it looks like, uh, from all the indications we have, that Xi Jinping, um, although he has, he's already widely seen as the most powerful leader after um, Mao Zedong, that he will be amassing even more power. So, uh, for example, last October, he conferred himself uh, this um, venerated title of party core, which uh, Mao Zedong uh, didn't even have. And then, uh, lo and behold, just a few months later, he again conferred himself the title of, uh, in Chinese, the Zhui uh, Gao Tong Shui, which translates as Supreme Military uh, Commander. Uh, and um, what my Chinese friends in Beijing are telling me is that the 19th Party Congress is a coronation event uh, which will f formally identify uh, Xi Jinping as the Mao Zedong of the 21st century. Uh, uh, we could go into this uh, in the Q&A session as to the uh, expected distribution of powers on the Politburo and the Politburo Standing Committee. But first of all, uh, the key question is, uh, number one, 
why uh, Xi Jinping, who is already so powerful uh, in the past five years, why is still seeking is he seeking more power? Well, um, power is is it just power for its own sake? Well, uh, there's quite a interesting history in the Communist Party regarding that, and and that is uh, the more power uh, which a leader, for example. Uh, Mao Zedong had uh, the less secure he seems to be, which seems paradoxical until you saw what happened during the Cultural Revolution when uh, Mao Zedong, who was half man, half god, uh, he uh, pulled out all the stops to um, decimate his uh, anointed successors, uh, Liu Xiaoqi, and, and, and so forth. So uh, with Xi Jinping, um, it's even more obvious because we have to remember that uh, Xi Jinping was almost an accidental uh, general secretary uh, before he was picked by uh, Jiang Zemin. So, uh, so William, let me let me stop you right there and, and go go to Richard here. So, we, now we have Xi Jinping amassing even more and more power, um, but to what end? Basically, that's my that's a question. And and what does it signif signify or indicate in the potential course of, of China's uh, rise? Because lots of Americans look at this strong man. Compare him with our own emerging strongman, if you will, uh, and and what lessons can we learn, and, and what 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 sense do you have of how how this is going to, going to go? Well, is it going to ultimately end badly for China? Um, or is Xi Jinping's power grab hurting uh, the party state in any way? Uh, so how how do you see that unrolling and, and unfolding? Um, yes, well, on the first point, in the comparison to the United States, I think it's apt to say. In China, you've got the most disciplined Chinese leader, most powerful Chinese leader, you might say most powerful Chinese leader in you know, centuries or whatever, but most disciplined Chinese leader uh, and powerful Chinese leader. In the US, you've got the most ill-disciplined leader uh, leading perhaps the weakest White House. You know, that's very, for the US and the US allies, that's a very sort of ominous um, trend. On Xi Jinping generally, um, the, the, I, I guess the big trend is the, uh, the uh, reinforcement of the power of the party itself. And as I think as you and I were discussing beforehand about the party uh, not just overshadowing the state, but ab absorbing the state. Under Xi, you've got the weakest state council uh, in memory. Uh, he, the primary way of discipline, disciplining the party itself has been through the anti-corruption mechanisms which reside within the party, um, not in the legal system. Um, he has uh, reinforced his, the power of the party over policy making. In other words, the, the leading groups which form policy uh, have all been strengthened. And of course, he's the chairman of just about every one of them. Most importantly, that uh, looking at the uh, economic policy. Um, and I think, and Willie will correct me if I'm wrong here, just about any other, any Chinese leader, except perhaps for Mao at a few times here or there, has always had an identifiable rival. And Xi Jinping has none uh, that I can see. And after this party congress, um, uh, they, they might have receded even further into the distance. You know, because if you are going to reinforce the power of the party, inevitably you're going to have to eliminate, marginalize, or tame uh, all rivals for the moment. As to where it takes China, um, without being a wimp about that, it's a little bit too early to tell. But one of the, and um, we'll get onto this, but one of the great successes of the Communist Party in recent years is to have a peaceful handover of power. Um, and we can get into a bait, debate about whether there are, there are norms or whatever within the party and the like. But it's, it's very difficult for me to see how Xi Jinping continues on this path of amassing absolute power without there being a bigger, much bigger problem uh, later when, when, it, when it diminishes or when he, when he leaves office. So uh, let, me, let me just uh, throw in two, two issues there. So we have Xi Jinping now amassing more and more and more power, becoming Mao-like in a way in terms of his stature. We have the propaganda uh, organs whipping up, sort of uh, uh, putting his face on plates and sticking his face on posters and calling him the core of the party. So on one hand, you have that, this increasingly powerful guy. But on the other, other hand, you have two issues. One, it seems to be increasing paranoia about the West, a campaign against hostile Western forces, campaigns in universities to root out any pro-Western sensibilities in Chinese textbooks, campaigns against 
five feminists in China who tried to launch a, a push against groping on public transportation, and now one of them has been banned from travel for 10 years. And so while he's so strong, what is he so afraid of? Secondly, uh, and this is an economic question because I think this is one of the keys to China's survival, is he's already quite powerful, but yet he has not embraced the economic reforms that he seemed to have championed in 2012. What's with that? Uh, Willie? Yeah, could I just jump in a little bit? Well, uh, Xi Jinping is the closet Maoist, um, despite uh, his, of course, um, uh, <clears throat> public persona as a, as a um, disciple of uh, Deng Xiaoping's reforms. Uh, what's happening is Xi Jinping, he sees a, almost a um, Manichaean uh, struggle between good and evil, good, of course, being the uh, the Chinese model and so forth. So um, his most famous uh, dictum after becoming head of the party and head of the army is to show the sword, to, to brandish the, the sword, to, um, well, not just um, traditional uh, countries with sovereignty disputes with China, such as uh, Japan and uh, Vietnam and Philippines, but also the US. So that's why he has been so, putting so much energy on beefing up the already formidable uh, uh, military machine of the PLA. So I think with the US, there, there would be no, no compromise. And I think uh, the best things which has, ha has happened to Xi Jinping the past one, two years is Donald Trump, because uh, with Donald Trump's isolationist tendencies, with Donald Trump's um, very uns unscientific approach to the issue of climate change, I think that that has given Xi Jinping a perfect uh, uh, propaganda uh, 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 venue whereby he can uh, stick himself as the uh, uh, as a responsible adult, as the uh, even the rule setter of international finance and climate change discussions. Uh, secondly, regarding uh, economic reform, I'll just say one word, and, and that is uh, for Xi Jinping, he is paranoid about the possible demise of the Communist Party because the Communist Party has no ballot box legitimacy. Its legitimacy is uh, basically based on two uh, pillars. One is nationalism, which um, well, we, we could discuss it further, but nationalism is a double-edged sword, I think we all know. Secondly is uh, economic growth, which I think um, uh, my colleague here would discuss. But on the general principle of uh, reform, uh, let me uh, share with you uh, one uh, Xi Jinping dictum, which has not been uh, published, uh, publicized, and, and that is his view on power. So he once said, uh, whatever power which the Communist Party had in the past, uh, those powers may not exist today. And however powerful we are today, there is no guarantee that uh, we, we will be that powerful uh, one or two years down the road. And um, Xi Jinping also has this so-called theory of the Titanic, which again has not been publicized widely. And that is, uh, China is a huge country, uh, we cannot, the Communist Party or the government cannot afford to make a so-called subversive mistake. That means the mistake which might vitiate the uh, socialism uh, uh, attributes of the party. So he says, China is a huge country, it's like the Titanic, if the Titanic um, starts going down, it, it just goes down just like that. You know, there's nothing we can do. And, and the only thing we can do is to ensure that we do not commit this subversive areas, which is to succumb to the sovereign songs of uh, capitalism, of um, you know, Western style uh, economic and social reforms and so forth. So I'm quite convinced that uh, as he gets more power in the United Congress, uh, it's quite unlikely that he will pick up on the threats of reforms, first introduced by Deng Xiaoping and subsequently by um, uh, Jiang Zemin and Hu Jintao. So, Richard, to, to that point, there have been uh, general optimists in the West who've looked at Xi Jinping and said, well, once the 19th Party Congress is finished, then he's going to really embrace uh, a significant and ambitious economic reform. And what's, what's your view on that as his power grows? Um, first of all, I'll dis disagree with Willie on one point. I don't think he's a Maoist. I don't know whether that applies properly. I mean, there's a lot of different phrases. You know, he, he talks like Mao, acts like Deng, or he sort of 
talks like dung and acts like Mao, and I kind of get confused. But, I mean, the general theory about Xi Jinping changing course after the Party Congress, you know, in Chinese, I think they say turning left so he can turn right. In other words, having consolidated his sort of party power base, he can then move in a so-called more reformist direction. Um, I, I don't believe that, and I think in some respects there's a problem with labels. Uh, we in the West, and I don't want to generalize too much, always talk about reform, and by reform we mean moving, becoming more like us, and I think that's really the wrong way to look at it. Um, I think there's no doubt he's been an extremely uh, reformist or has you know, forced change in, in politics in China and the way that operates. Uh, he hasn't done the same with the economy. Um, and that's for the reason, you know, as party secretary, you have enormous executive powers to, you know, uh, investigate people for corruption or clean up the party and the like, you know, sack this and that other party secretary. He's got a national security council. He's used his power with the military, et cetera, et cetera, quite an activist. Those kind of powers that he can wield in politics don't apply to the economy. You know, an economy doesn't sort of jump up or down just because uh, you say so. Uh, there's all sorts of other factors at work. And while I think the Chinese economy at the moment is having a slight, you know, there's a sense of renewed optimism about it, I'm not so sure that's well-founded in the long term um, because of various issues related to debt and the like. So I don't think we should expect any uh, massive change in economic direction after the 19th Party Congress. Um, I think we'll get much of what we've seen in the last five years, that is an attempt to keep the headline growth up, uh, an attempt to keep debt under control, which won't be possible, and, an, and because of that, an attempt to stave off any possible financial crisis, in other words, more firefighting. So that's a rather bland path forward, but it's a very much a stasis, I think. So with that, I mean, having, having uh, been a uh, correspondent in Japan, are we looking at China kind of embracing, if you will, for better or worse, the Japanese model of, of muddling through? And what does that pretend for this idea of the, the China dream uh, and the, the idea of China being the next hegemon in Asia? I think China obviously is a lot poorer than Japan was before Japan sort of uh, started to stagnate. Uh, you know, I personally think China has a lot more room to grow. Um, China does have a dynamic uh, private sector uh, as well, which is one new growth engine for the uh, economy. But over time, you know, by, by the time we get to 2020 and the sort of very negative demographic trends kick in, uh, the sorts of productivity gains you need to over overcome, uh, you know, the, uh, not just a falling working population, but a falling population and the like, um, and the fact that the need, the need to sustain the state sector, to give it a sort of core role in the economy, um, and the sheer size of debt. You know, we all used to think that Japan had, uh, had a, a, an entirely new economic model which could go on forever. It, it wasn't true. I doubt it's true of China. So at some stage, there has to be a crunch in China, and it's just a matter of whether, how they manage it and how big it is. Could I just jump in? Sure, sure. Well, uh, regarding economic reform, um, I guess uh, Xi Jinping um, is not a policy wonk. Uh, he is not uh, as interested in policy matters as, for example, his uh, number two colleague, uh, Premier Li Keqiang, even though, unfortunately, uh, as, as uh, Professor McGregor said... Uh, uh, I wish, <laughs> not Professor. Uh, uh, <laughs> Premier Li Keqiang has been has been sidelined. Has been sidelined uh, again. Uh, a, a prime example of the party absorbing the state. Um, at this stage of the economy, um, uh, Xi Jinping has basically followed the time-honored um, or uh, slightly Japanese model of using uh, government injections uh, in uh, infrastructure projects and other sectors of the economy to prop up the economy, to prop up a 6.5% growth rate. Because as both uh, former Premier um, Zhu Rongji and Li Keqiang have said, uh, for the party to remain stable, uh, they need at least a, a growth rate, a minimum growth rate of 6.5%. But if that growth rate is attained um, mainly through government investment, then we see uh, situations uh, like the um, debt crisis. According to respectable Western analysts, uh, China's total social debt is about uh, is more than three 
times GDP. And according to uh, a very respectable uh, financial analyst, uh, Charlene Chu, who was quoted by the Financial Times uh, a month ago, saying that the uh, non-performing non loans rate uh, for Chinese banks is actually as high as 25%, not as low as 5% as official figures render. So uh, what we are fearing is that um, in the year 2015, remember the uh, stock market crash, uh, the, the um, unrealistic euphoria about the stock market when uh, 90 million uh, stock buyers in China who have no experience with, with, with such um, modern uh, financial instruments, they, they power into the stock market, they lost a lot of money and so forth. But in 2015, the stock market was instrumental in propping up the economy. And in the past two years, we are seeing the um, real estate market, the real estate market. And there are analysts who are now comparing the Chinese situation with uh, the bubble uh, property sector to the uh, subprime situation uh, in the run-up to the 2008 financial crisis. But, but in, in, in defense in of US. China, if you will, people are predicting that the Chinese economy is going to collapse basically every year since 1989. And so far, they've actually achieved relatively remarkable growth. So. Um, I had a final question that I'd like to, to raise before we open it up to you. Um, and that's, what, is, what, is, what keeps Xi Jinping up at night? In particular, what is his relationship with the most dynamic part of the Chinese economy, which is the private sector? Um, we, you mentioned before uh, the, the panel started that he has indeed conducted a variety of campaigns, if you will, against individual private entrepreneurs in terms of, in, in, in some cases, snatching and grabbing them from overseas, in other cases, squeezing them in China. And, and, and how is the party going to manage this really key relationship it has between um, itself and, and, the, and the most dynamic part of China's economy? Richard, could you, could you speak to that? It's a very interesting question. I think, you know, it's true that about 70% of output these days in the Chinese economy is from the private sector. I mean, 70%. Yeah, right, and yeah. the private sector is not always in private like we think, but nonetheless, it's, it is the dominant sector. Uh, I, I, I just read a book on uh, Russia um, uh, and Putin's Russia, how Putin's Russia came into being, and we all know that China is full of li it has lots of libraries full of books about how China shouldn't go down the Soviet path, uh, and that mainly focuses on how the party is managed. But the second part of the Soviet Russian story is how the oligarchs stole state assets, essentially. You know, if, if China had gone down the Soviet path, then Petro-China would be owned by one single person. And obviously China didn't do that to their benefit, I think. But we do have uh, fantastically big private companies in China these days. Um, Alibaba now has the biggest money market fund in the world. That's happened in just a couple of years or so. And I think a core tenet of uh, the, 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 the party's outlook is that there should be no rival centres of power. Uh, in the last decade, they brought private entrepreneurs into the party, but these private companies are now very, getting very big. So we've seen a sort of disciplining of them in recent months and years. Ambang, Wanda in particular, they've cracked down on the CEOs. And so there's a new interesting dynamic, I think, between Xi Jinping and the private sector. I'll just finish very quickly. It's hard to know what his personal views are, but he was in charge of Fujian province and Zhejiang province, which are two of the have economies dominated by the private sector. He must have a, a sense of its value, but I don't often see that enunciated. Interesting. All right, um, we'd like to open it up to questions. Sir, uh, there's people walking around with uh, microphones, and if you could uh, grab one of them right, right here. Coming. Thank you. Sorry, I wasn't sure if you were pointing at me or not. Uh, good morning. Um, I was just interested if if uh, one or, or two or, or all of you could talk about, um, you know, how how China's handling Hong Kong uh, in that situation and what it might mean for Taiwan. It it I've been to Hong Kong. I don't know five or six times this year. It definitely seems like there's this undercurrent of the one country, two systems is kind of slowly breaking. And I, I guess there's a bunch of, of uh, uh, people that are upset about what they're doing with, I guess, the new the new rail station and the, the Chinese security or customs on the Hong Kong side or whatever. But how how do you think that plays out, and 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 what does that potentially mean for Taiwan as they're watching the one country two systems thing with Hong Kong? Thank really, you. Would you like to address this? Well, sure. 
Uh, I think the most important thing to remember uh, about one country, two systems, which perhaps is uh, Deng Xiaoping's most far-sighted uh, theoretical invention. Uh, one country, two systems is, is not something cast in stone. It, uh, its implementation um, it's, has to be done uh, in accordance with the changing of um, uh, economics, po political foreign policy dynamics. So uh, what happened in the, in the early 80s when Margaret Thatcher was negotiating with Deng Xiaoping was that at that time, uh, China, uh, Hong Kong's GDP accounted for more than 15-16% uh, uh, of the entire country. And at that time, you can say that Beijing needed Hong Kong uh, significantly more than the other way around. However, 20 years after the handover of sovereignty, uh, Hong Kong's GDP is only about 2% of the national. And uh, the Hong Kong economy uh, cannot survive without Beijing. So. Um, so it's not uh, difficult to understand that for uh, the mandarins sitting in Zhongnanhai, the party headquarters, uh, they want to exert more influence in Hong Kong. They want uh, their orders obeyed, uh, particularly for Xi Jinping, who is a super nationalist. Well, uh, I just mentioned that uh, after the death of communism, uh, the uh, Communist Party, which does not have a ballot box to legitimacy, it only has two pillars of legitimacy. One is economic growth, which we discussed, and the other one is nationalism. So Xi Jinping, in his latest uh, statements uh, on uh, Taiwan, Hong Kong, Tibet, Xinjiang, uh, both on and off the record, Xi Jinping pointed to the imperative of cracking down on uh, so-called pro-independence movements in Taiwan and Hong Kong. Uh, you might ask the question whether that is indeed a separatist movement uh, in Hong Kong. Well, I can tell you point blank and that this is a red herring. This is a red herring which is unfortunately being used as a pretext by uh, Chinese cadres to justify uh, cracking down on Hong Kong. So what's happening in Hong Kong in terms of uh, uh, political participation, uh, freedom of ex expression, and so forth, uh, is that it's, I'm afraid it's, it's all the way downhill. And, and uh, this is because of the changing power dynamics, uh, not just between Beijing and Hong Kong, but also within the uh, Asia Pacific region, right? So uh, more broadly, I think to address your question, it does not bode well for uh, exporting that model to Taiwan. I mean, clearly there are many Taiwanese people who've seen the actions in Hong Kong and are even more alienated. Uh, and less interested in, in any type of uh, federation. Uh, the issue for Taiwan, I think much more than that, is what's the, its economic future? Uh, and how are, are the young people in Taiwan going to have uh, be able to enter productive lives? I think that's a huge issue. And I think the calculus on the mainland side is that Taiwan now needs China more than China needs Taiwan. And so over the course of time, the Chinese will exert huge e economic influence over the people in the island of Taiwan. Uh, to force it to come to heel. And I think that's going to be a very slow and painful process for the people of Taiwan. Right. Yeah. Well, I think, very briefly, Taiwan is becoming uh, weaker uh, at the same time as its people are less and less interested in reunification or federation. So that's a very bad trend. Gentleman in the back. Uh, Jim McGregor. I'm not related to Richard McGregor. So. Um, well, he's my younger like brother, second, actually. Let's talk about Xi Jinping and his relationship with the Chinese people. Um, you know, he's come in, and, and, and the party, he's come in, and the party had always been headed maybe towards kind of an LDP um, arrangement where they had internal party debates that would bubble up, um, but they were kept behind closed doors. He's changed the party rules, so you can't do that. It's top-down Leninism, listen to the top, you can't quibble about policy within. In Chinese society, among wealthy people and the elites who are being investigated for corruption, um, their attitude is, wait a second, you're saying I'm corrupt? Um, I, I worked in your system. I did not want to spend my time chasing around party secretaries and getting their kids into Harvard. Chinese younger people who are fairly worldly and despite the blocks in the internet, um, kind of know what's going on in the world, are now, she seems to be trying to make them more Chinese again, where in the schools you, you don't question authority. I mean, he's, you know, he's trying to roll everything back to being much more Chinese and much under control. How does that bode for getting along with 
Chinese society, the elites, and the party. Yeah, it's a very hard question. I mean, you would, uh, I'm afraid I missed the, the presentation this morning from Pew. I don't know whether it touched on this at all, but you'd have to, you know, the general sense is that she is very popular amongst the people, very unpopular amongst the uh, uh, large parts of the party because they're his target uh, in an aim to get popular support. Uh, you know, as long as uh, Chinese people's lives keep getting better, um, then I think he's got a, a huge base on which to build all these other things that you're talking about. You know, uh, sinicization or whatever you want to call it, of, you know, greater of education, universities, et cetera, et cetera, all the other political campaigns. I think they will, um, they may not be welcome uh, or, to you know, barely tolerable, but if the country succeeds, then he succeeds. And I think it starts to break down um, uh, when that's no longer the case. Well, very briefly, um, I think Xi Jinping um, was quite popular uh, with the general public until uh, the stock market crisis in July um, uh, 2015, when um, an estimated 90 million uh, small-scale stock buyers lost somewhere between uh, 5 to 7 trillion uh, RMB. Uh, if you look at the figures uh, themselves, published by the uh, Chinese authorities, and of course, if you believe those figures, uh, the economy has not been doing that badly for the men uh, in the street because the uh, annual uh, improvement in standard of living has been growing at 7.4%, which is above the rate of um, uh, GDP growth rate, not to mention the rate of inflation, and the uh, Gini coefficient, the measurement of rich poor divide, has improved significantly from uh, 0 0.473 in 2013 to uh, last year's uh, 0 0.465. Even though um, my uh, sources, uh, many sociology professors in Beijing are saying that the real Gini coefficient is more like 0.6%, which is a, a horrendous figure. So uh, what is important, I think, is that Xi Jinping has convinced the people that uh, it is not uh, crony capitalism which is driving the, the system because uh, despite this um, relentless anti-corruption campaign against the, the rich and, and some of these uh, major uh, members of the 100 most powerful clans in the party, we still see Xi Jinping um, giving the uh, lenient treatment, uh, a slap on the wrist to most of his cronies within the Gang of Princelings. That means uh, some uh, in the anti-corruption fight, uh, many of the Princelings are more equal than the others. So I think until that happens, uh, his popular base might be um, eroding very fast. Uh, but to your point, Jim, also, uh I live, having lived in China for an, another iteration, most recently uh, ending up last year, my sense was definitely among many people, he was quite popular for a while, but at the same time, the actions that the party's taken in terms of an unrelenting crackdown on academic freedom, on a variety of things that the party in the past just did not bother with, indicates an increased paranoia on the side of the party state and the security services. And the party understands its country a lot better than we do, uh, I, I, you know, I, would, I would say. And they obviously know things that are going on. And so when we look at China, we look at Xi on the on surface, clearly he's quite powerful. But in China, more than, in, in, in many ways, more so than any, any other country, everything's great until it's not. And, and see, I, 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 my sense is, um, in cracking down so hard on this dissent, uh, I think he, he understands things that we don't understand about, about the problem, and, uh, uh, the, the party's popularity and his own personal popularity as well. So I think, I think from my perspective, um, the, the more he grabs for power, I sense more potential weakness uh, in, on, 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 on his flank. Uh, David. Thank you. Uh, I'm wondering what the foreign policy implications are of this this focus on domestic problems. Is, is the focus on domestic problems enforcing foreign policy restraint, 
or are foreign policy confrontations and crises being used to reinforce Xi Jinping's uh, leadership uh, struggle? Take that, Richard. Uh, well, I can have a go. Well, foreign policy, I think, you know, one thing we do forget about Xi Jinping when we're talking about what a strong and powerful leader he is, he's certainly very decisive. Uh, he's a risk taker. Um, but he also came to the job uh, when his country was a very different country from when Hu Jintao had taken over in 2002. When Hu Jintao took over, the China was the eighth or ninth or tenth largest economy in the world. It hadn't passed through joining the WTO with flying colors, etc. It hadn't gone through the 2008 financial crisis. Uh, Chinese think in a much better way than the West handled and the like. So Xi Jinping is a different leader on foreign policy, but he also took over a much more powerful country. All sorts of things that he can do now, uh, he is doing now because China can, because they have the military capability to back it up. This is decades of investment uh, in, in, in military power. So I think it's important to remember that. And in that respect, even though Xi Jinping has moved very fast, as I said, decisive risk taking, I think the policies that he's rolling out are also um, uh, pretty much consistent with what China has always wanted. They can just do it now. That's the first thing. The second thing is that one of, I think, China's great failings is they have not been able to seduce other countries persuade other countries, very little soft power in China. The two big initiatives we see now, or t one symbolic, the Asia Infrastructure Investment Bank and the Belt and Road Initiative, are really um, big efforts at economic sedu seduction, you might say economic colonialism, whatever, but seduction as well, to bring countries into China's orbit. So it's, this is perhaps the start of a, a form of persuasion or soft economic power which is much smarter, I think, than um, uh, perhaps falling into confrontations in the East and South China Seas. Um, could I briefly jump in? Um, well, certainly, as I said, um, nationalism being now a key pillar of the legitimacy of the party, uh, Xi Jinping from day one has been stoking the flames of nationalism, particularly amongst uh, Chinese under 40 years of age. And to some extent, he has been very successful. Uh, I think uh, one uh, respectable professor from Beijing yesterday mentioned the Belt and Road Initiative as uh, an overarching uh, vision, uh, perhaps the, the most original idea to have come out of Xi Jinping apart from the Chinese dream. And of course, uh, there are close um, uh, affinity between the Chinese dream and uh, Belt and Road strategy. So uh, it is a uh, fairly ambitious, uh, overarching project to project chi both Chinese talents of power. Uh, the major problem with the Belt and, uh, with the Belt and Road strategy is that uh, it's related to what our discussion about the Chinese economy. Uh, with a country which is heavily in debt, uh, you may ask the big, big question whether uh, Beijing has the um, big war chest, has the wherewithal to sustain uh, huge investments in the Belt and Road. Well, I, I have studied uh, most of Chinese projects along the uh, 65, 68 countries in which uh, they have had investments related to the OBOR strategy. And you can say that some of the most eye-catching, some of the most sexy projects, for example, the uh, China-Pakistan uh, economic corridor, the China's investments in the Hamantotu uh, uh, um, base in uh, Sri Lanka, and also some other projects, including the uh, very ambitious uh, Belgrade Budapest uh, uh, railway. Um, well, these look more like ODA, Chinese Overseas De Economic Aid, rather than um, um, a cooperation, win-win uh, style uh, cooperation between different countries. Uh, questions have been asked, particularly about uh, projects such as the, um, the, the China-Pakistan Economic Corridor, because it's, uh, in, it involves an investment close to 50 billion US dollars, and it is located in um, Baluchistan, which is one of the most unstable part of uh, the Pakistan, and uh, throughout the project, the Chinese PLA has to send uh, many 
uh, uh, soldiers to protect Chinese engineers and workers working there. Mm. So uh, it's not necessarily a sustainable uh, model of uh, economic uh, engagement with the rest of the world. We have time for one more question, the woman in the scarf. Thank you. I'm Devorah Kaufman with the Zhuhai Representative Office in North America, based here in LA. And when I go to Zhuhai, everywhere I look, I see these really captivating propaganda posters about the China dream with really lovely artwork. And when I've asked my colleagues about this, the, what is the China dream? You know, they're really quite dismissive. It doesn't seem to have any relevance to their life. They're interested in buying a home and they're interested in getting an iPhone. So my question is... Maybe even an iPhone X. Maybe even an iPhone X. Which is hard X, to pronounce right. in Chinese. Right. <laughs> so my question is, how much does the China dream really resonate with the population, with the Lao Baixing? And how much is that um, something that the people can rally around the political leadership as a theme uh, going forward? Or is it just a kind of a trite cliche that people just dismiss? Um, I I'll take a stab at just that. Um, when the China dream came out, um, lots of my China's, Chinese friends said, yeah, I know what my China dream is, to immigrate to the United States. Um, uh, there's the, the Chinese propaganda is unrelenting, as we all know, um, but the reality in China is that in the past, the propaganda was the only thing going. But now Chinese people can open up their iPhones, get on the web, and there's a lot of things competing for their attention that are cool, interesting, you know, ex-Chinese film star with Y Chinese film star caught in a tryst in Hong Kong, here's the video. Uh, and so that issue with the fact that Chinese culture in quotation marks, has just expanded and the choices people have to focus on have expanded that statements from the government about we should think like this, we should be more Chinese, we should love the China dream, we should love Xinjiang, have a lot less traction because they're being competed with with the next sexy boy band. Um, or the dream of getting a large uh, uh, home, home TV you know, screen center, uh, which is about the size of a Honda Odyssey or the next new apartment. And so uh, I think that uh, from my perspective, the, the, the ability of the party state to be successful in pushing out its vision for its country has actually um, weakened over time with the massive expansion of the Chinese entertainment sector. And so I, amongst my friends who are, you know, uh, not totally elderly yet, um, but, but even amongst their kids, there's a lot less traction for, for, for party propaganda. Yes, nationalism is an issue, but when you scratch a lot of these kids, it, it comes off pretty fast. Do you, when you ask them, are you actually willing to go die, to die for China in, in, uh, in Vietnam defending the nine, the nine dash line? The answer generally is going to be no. Um, I'd rather, you know, take a vacation to London or Paris and get a Hermes scarf. Um, so so I, I look at the, the abilities of the party to really get into the, the minds of people to be a lot less, less powerful than it used to be. But that's just one man's view. So. Yeah, I'd say it's, it's, I mean, it is maybe background noise to sort of consumer society, but, you know, I think for the party it's important to have an overarching narrative um, and I wouldn't underestimate nationalism. Uh, I wouldn't underestimate, uh, uh, however they've learned to believe it, the support for, um, you know, the general central government's positions on sovereignty, which now extends beyond Tibet and Xinjiang to the South China Sea and the like. So um, while it is a bit corny, um, uh, I think it maybe is uh, uh, pretty potent. All right, with that, uh, we're ending our panel. Appreciate it. Thank you very much to Richard and Willie. Thank you all.